I am extremely excited today because I shall be discussing with you one of my favorite books by one of my favorite authors. The author is Ian Watt. Ian Watt was a scholar, a critic, an historian, and above all, a teacher. He was professor of English at Stanford University. We shall discuss today Ian Watt's work, Ian Watt's book, The Rise of the Novel, or more accurately, the opening chapter of the book. This is perhaps the best possible introduction to the work of Ian Watt. It's an exemplification of Ian Watt at his very best. The chapter has a very interesting title, Realism and a Novel Form. There are three key words in this title, Realism, Novel, Form. We shall look at them one by one. What is Realism? Put very simply, put very simplistically, perhaps, realism is an attempt to understand and present life as it actually is. In this context, realism is an attempt to depict the world and the experiences of the world exactly as experienced by the person. In realism, there is no attempt to glorify. There is no attempt to exaggerate. There is no attempt to romanticize. In realism, you present it not as better than it is, not as worse than it is, but exactly as it is. As I've already pointed out, realism is the sine qua non of the novel. That is the basic thesis of Ian Watt. If there is no realism, there is no novel. Now, what is the novel? The novel is a prose narrative of considerable length. It is an invented narrative. The novel does not claim to be a report. The novel does not claim to be a factual document. The novel is supposedly born out of the creative mind of its author. In fact, in many novels, you find a statement in one of the early pages. The events described in this book have never taken place in the past and will never take place in the future. And if there is any similarity between what is described in this book and what has taken place or what is going to take place, it's purely coincidental. I think this statement gives us a clue. The novel is an invented story. The novel is born out of the creative mind of the novelist. At least that is the assumption. But this claim gives us a clue. Almost all novels are based on what actually happened. All novels are based on what the novelist personally knows. So though we say that the novel is an invented story, the fact is that almost every novel is not pure invention. Almost every novel and the events in it coincide at least partially with life and the events in life. Now we come to the last key word of the title, form. I think in this context form is used to mean model or shape or genre. The novel as a genre, the novel as a form, the main point that Ian Watts is trying to make is that realism 
is the key to the novel as a genre. This chapter attempts to analyze, evaluate and comprehend the relation between realism on the one hand and the novel form and the novel genre on the other. The book opens with a short preface. In the preface, Ian Watt reveals that the process of putting together this book began in a way in 1938 when he started investigating the relation between the reading public and the novel form, between the emergence of the reading public and the emergence of the novel as a genre. Some 10 years later, these investigations were crystallized in the form of a study which was presented as a fellowship dissertation at Cambridge. But Ian Watt admits that this is not the whole story. There is no doubt that the reading public exerted a tremendous influence on the early novelists. But there are other more crucial questions which have to be answered. For example, how far were novelists like Richardson and Fielding conditioned by the climate of social and moral experience which they were subjected to and which they shared with their reading public? How far was this climate of social and moral experience responsible for triggering the rise of the novel? Above all, there is an even more fundamental question. What is the novel? What are the defining literary characteristics of the novel? This study is an attempt to arrive at answers in these areas. The rest of the preface is devoted by the writer to express his thanks, to express his gratitude to the various persons and institutions who played a role in shaping this work. I think that the preface gives us a foretaste of what is to come. We get a mild flavour of the book in the preface. We come to know that Ian Watt is a writer who values precision very much. We understand, we realize how he makes his points with tremendous precision, how he organizes his ideas with remarkable system, how the ideas are arranged in a remarkably systematic, remarkably organized manner. And above all, how the writer is capable of marshalling his contentions, of marshalling his arguments in a powerfully logical manner. At the very outset, Ian Watt admits that the student of the novel form faces vast issues and problematic questions. To begin with, what is the novel form? How does the novel differ from earlier prose narratives? The three authors who are generally looked upon as the founders of the genre are, are Defoe, Richardson and Fielding. Daniel Defoe wrote Robinson Crusoe, Samuel Richardson wrote Pamela and Henry Fielding wrote Tom Jones. The writer Ian Watt raises the question why is it that the three founders, the three founding fathers of the novel form 
lived in the same generation, belonged to the same generation. Is it an accident that together they shaped this new genre? According to the writer, how much we accept the genius of Defoe, Richardson and Fielding, there were circumstances which facilitated the, the rise of the novel form, the emergence of the novel form. If this is so, what were those circumstances, literary circumstances and social circumstances? Returning to the earlier question of what is the novel form and how the novel significantly differs from the prose narratives of earlier periods, Ian Watt finds that the key to the novel is realism. The defining characteristic of the novel is realism. Realism should not be seen as romanticism inversed. Realism is not merely an attempt to see the seamy side of life. According to Ian Watt, realism resides not in the life it presents, but in the way it presents life. And the word realism has its root, the word realism has its roots in French criticism, in French painting. Finally, the writer takes up the question of correspondence between literary realism, life as it is represented in realistic literature and the real life which it imitates or which it attempts to imitate. This is more a philosophical question than a literary one. Ian Watt sees, us, sees it as an epistemological question. Here I would like to say a couple of words about two important, con two important terms, ontology and epistemology. Ontology deals with facts, with reality, with existence, with being. Epistemology deals with information, with knowledge, with awareness. If something exists, and you study its existence, its ontology. But how did you become aware of that existence? Your knowledge of that existence comes under the rubric of epistemology. In this section, Ian Watt gives us an overview of the concept of realism in Western philosophy. Realism is opposed to universalism. In classical times and in the Middle Ages, universalism was the reigning ideology. Universalism believes that real reality does not lie in the particular. We can see and experience the particular through our senses. But according to the universalist, the particulars do not constitute the reality. The reality is the universal, which lies behind the particulars. In Western philosophy, realism arose largely because of the efforts of philosophers like René Descartes, the French philosopher, who spent much of his life in the Dutch Republic, John Locke, the English philosopher, and uh, Thomas Reid, the Scottish philosopher. Real realism emphasizes the experience of the particular by the individual through his senses. The world, according to the realist, is quite real and it is this real world which is comprehended by the observer through his senses. The writer observes that philosophical realism has in general a tremendous bearing 
on the novel. The general temper of philosophical realism has been critical and anti-traditional and innovating. The methodology of philosophical realism has been the study of the particulars of experience by the individual investigator and philosophical realism has raised issues like the issue of semantics, the issue of the correspondence between word and its reality and its meaning and the reality it allegedly signifies. All these have exerted a tremendous influence on the novel, on prose fiction, since the days of Defoe and Richardson. Ian Watt opens this section by throwing light on the magnificent contribution of René D Descartes to philosophical realism. Ian Watt says that this contribution was largely that of method. The thoroughness with which Descartes was determined to apply the method he had developed. Truth and the pursuit of truth became the preoccupations of philosophical realism. The pursuit of truth came to be seen as an individual activity, as a highly personal effort, completely free from the traditions of earlier thought. An orphan departing from the traditions of earlier thought. The writer is able to establish a parallel between this and the emergence of the novel. The primary criterion in the case of the novel was the truth of its personal experience. While Chaucer and Spencer and Milton borrowed their plots from tradition, the early novelists crafted, largely crafted their own plots. That is why the quality of originality is very important when it comes to the novel. The plot of the novel is not taken from the past but created by the novelist himself. The writer points out that when Daniel Defoe started writing, he took little notice of the dominant critical thinking which inclined towards the idea of writers borrowing their plots from tradition. Instead, he gave a free flow to his literary instincts and crafted his own plots. Therefore, Richardson and Fielding are three very different kinds of writers. But all of them did the same thing. They refused to bow before the reigning critical thinking that a writer should seek inspiration from the traditions of the past and write perhaps in new, new ways what had already been written earlier. Instead, Defoe, Richardson and Fielding wrote as their literary instincts asked them to write. And this was no mean achievement given the facts and circumstances of the times. In this section, Ian Watt explains that it was not merely the plot that had to be changed. Other things had to be changed as well. In the case of the earlier narratives, the plots were mostly drawn from tradition. 
But in the case of the novel, the founding fathers of the genre decided to create their own plots, to borrow their plots from their own genius, to draw their plots from their own genius. But this is not the whole story. Other things about the novel had to be changed. Characterization. In the earlier narratives, the characters were human beings, just human beings. But in the novel, the characters were individual persons, individuals in the fullest sense of the word. Similarly, the background also had to be changed. In the earlier narratives, the backgrounds could be general, could be anywhere, could be any place. But in the novel, the backgrounds had to be specific, detailed. Thus, by changing the nature of the plot, the characterization and the background, the novel came to embody the individual appreciation of reality as much as the method of Descartes and Locke allowed them to appreciate reality using their consciousness. In this section, the writer explains that both the philosopher and the novelist started bestowing greater attention on the individual than had been common in the past. The individual came to be seen as a unit in his own right and not as a representative of a type. The problem of individual identity is closely linked to the epistemological status of the proper name. The identity of a person and his name are closely interconnected. One would even say that the name of a person is an important marker of his identity. This being so, the founding fathers of the novel adopted a rather revolutionary approach to the problem of naming their characters. In earlier narratives, the authors chose names for their characters which were fanciful, archaic, had roots in classical learning or suggested names that suggested that these characters were not characters in their own rights, were not individuals in their own right, but representatives of types. On the other hand, the early novelists, Defoe, Richardson, Fielding, chose names for their characters which were casual, commonplace, everyday, plausible, which were capable of convincing the readers that such characters could actually exist. The writer gives several examples from the early novelist Defoe Richardson Fielding to illustrate his point. It is true that this was not an overnight change. This was not a sudden revolution. The novelists took their own time to free themselves from the clutches of earlier traditions and to give names to their characters which reflected their particularizing approach to individuals who were part of society. The concepts developed by the English philosopher John Locke and the Scottish philosopher David Hume are extremely pertinent here. John Locke attempted to define personal identity, the identity of the person, and found that 
Personal identity is nothing but the identity of the consciousness over time. Locke explained that we are all aware of our consciousness. We are all aware of our conscious thoughts and conscious actions. And it is this consciousness evolving, developing, changing over time that gives us our sense of self, our self-identity. David Hume amplified on this and declared that if we had no memory, we would have no self. This is because it is in our memory that we preserve our conscious thoughts and conscious actions. And it is this awareness of preserved memories of conscious thoughts and conscious actions that give us our sense of self, our self-definition, our self-identity. Ian Watt is able to establish a striking parallel between these concepts of John Locke and David Hume and the developments in the genre of the novel. The writer explains that what novelists, including the Irish novelist Lawrence Stern, who wrote Tristram Shandy, and the French novelist Marcel Proust, I think the French pronounce it as Marcel Proust, who wrote the monumental novel In Search of Lost Time, In Search of Lost Time. Attempt to do is to carry out an exploration of the self as it evolves as a result of the interpenetration of the past and the present. The characters in these novels are shown with evolving self-identities and these self-identities are created as a result of developing memories, as a result of the intersection of past memories and present memories and these memories of are of the thoughts and actions of the characters. The approach adopted by the emerging genre of the novel to time was nothing short of revolutionary. From the ancient times it had been believed that the aim of literature is the portrayal of life, portrayal of life by values. E.M. Foster said that to this portrayal of life by values was added the portrayal of life by time by the novelist. It was with the rise of the novel that literature basically came to effect the portrayal of life by time. The significance of time, the significance of the passage of time, the significance of the temporal context were all lost on the writers of the classical world and the writers of the Middle Ages and even, for example, on Shakespeare. To Shakespeare, the world of Troy and Rome was not very different from his own world. It is not without significance that the word anachronism came to be used for the first time many decades after Shakespeare's death. It was this a historical approach to time adopted by literature that was drastically corrected by the early novelists. Defoe convinces us completely, at least at his best, Defoe at least at his best convinces us completely that a particular event is taking place at a particular place and at a particular time. Richardson took great pains to set the events of his narrative in a very detailed, in a very detailed time scheme. 
Fielding appears to have used an almanac. And the events in his narrative are consistent with one another, are chronologically consistent, are consistent with one another. And also, more importantly, consistent with external factors, including, interestingly, the faces of the moon. Time and place go hand in hand. Time and place are mutually correlative. A particular case is defined in relation to the coordinates of time and space. But the approach of earlier writers to space very much mirrored their approach to time. The space that we come across in earlier literature is vague, unlocalized, not specific. This is true even of Shakespeare. Dr. Johnson complained of Shakespeare that he had no regard for the distinctions of time and place. A sharp departure from this tradition can be found in the emerging genre of the novel. In the matter of space, the founding fathers of the novel effected as sharp a departure from tradition as they did in the matter of time. Defoe provides solidity to his settings through his remarkable treatment of movable objects. Richardson provides us with detailed descriptions of residences, including the famously memorable description of Grandison Hall. In Fielding's Tom Jones, we come across the first Gothic mansion in the history of the English novel. Fielding is as careful with the topography of his action as he is with the chronology of his action. For the first time in literature, space became particularized, localized and identifiable to the readers. We have now reached the penultimate section of the chapter. The main takeaway of the discussion so far is that the novel, with its emergence, effected a number of dramatic departures from the literary traditions of the past and that these departures were largely efforts to attain closeness, proximity between the narratives and the realities that the narratives described. Thus, the philosopher and the novelist have one aim in common, and that is the production of what claims to be authentic accounts of the experience of reality by individuals. However, there is one more departure which requires examination, and that is the striking departure that the founding fathers of the novel carried out from earlier traditions in the matter of prose style, right from classical times through the Middle Ages. The aim of the writer had been not authenticity, but beauty. What was prized was adornment. What was used was rhetoric. The aim was not to provide authentic descriptions, but 
to provide pleasurable descriptions even when these pleasurable descriptions were patently erroneous, patently false, even from the perspective of the writer himself. With the rise of the novel, the writer came to be concerned with the correspondence between words and things. Words and the things that they signify. A new prose style was forged, which was unadorned, stark, and which attempted to capture reality or individual experience as accurately, as fully, as comprehensively as possible. It is this prose style which sets writers like Defoe and Richardson apart from their predecessors. The closeness that Defoe's narratives attained was largely physical, while the closeness that Richard Richardson's narratives attained was largely emotional. It is true that in this matter, Fielding does not attain or even attempt to attain what Defoe and Richardson do. He continues to walk in the footsteps of his predecessors. The result is that Tom Jones lacks significantly in authenticity. And while reading Tom Jones, we do not get the impression that is a that it is a close and realistic description of the events presented ian watt explains that it is because of this prose style adopted by the novel that the novel is the most translatable of all literary forms no other genre can be translated into another language as easily as the novel. It is precisely for the same reason that novelists orphan write gracelessly and even with vulgarity. Above all, it is again the same reason that is responsible for the fact that of all the forms of literature, the form which least requires a commentary is the novel. After having walked us through the several analogies between philosophy and literature, Ian Watt, in the second section, in the very last section of the chapter, I think we can call it the essay because the chapter alone is prescribed for us, in the very last section of the essay, admits that these analogies are not proposed to be exact. We should not take the comparisons too far. He observes that philosophy is one thing and literature is another. Similarly, we need not see a causal connection between the changes in philosophy and the corresponding changes in literature. Even though it is true that the realism in philosophy did exert some influence on the realism in literature. According to the writer, the explanation for this, for these dramatic changes, is that a humongous change a humongous transformation took place in Western civilization. Since the Renaissance and the world picture of the Middle Ages was re replaced by a new picture, which was the new picture, which was a composite and developing picture, a picture which was the aggregate of the 
personal experiences of individuals at particular times, at particular places. The earlier world picture, the picture of the world picture of the Middle Ages was a static one. But that came to be replaced by a world picture which was an evolving one. And this new world picture is a changing, evolving world picture which is the particular experiences of particular individuals at particular times in particular places put together. The writer calls the narrative method used by the novel in order to attain its goals formal realism. He explains that this realism is not a literary doctrine. It does not have ideological bearings. It is only a set of procedures which are used in the novel in order to achieve the outcomes that the novel wants to achieve. This narrative method, this set of procedures is called formal realism because it is found in almost every novel and at the same time it is not found in other literary forms. It would appear that this narrative method is very much part and parcel of the literary form called the novel and hence can be termed formal realism. This does not mean that formal realism was the invention of the founding fathers of the novel form. As Ian Watt himself admits, elements of formal realism can be found in Homer himself. Not just in Homer, but in many, many earlier writers. But the difference is that in those writers, as in Homer, the passages displaying formal realism are relatively rare and they rather stand out from the general context. On the other hand, in writers like Defoe and Richardson, the entire work is oriented towards formal realism. The founding fathers of the novel were remarkably independent of the literary conventions that they felt interfered with their intentions. Their requirement was truth, literal truth, much more than it was in the case of their predecessors. While reading their works, while reading the works of Defoe and Richardson, one feels that one is going through evidence presented in a court of law. Ian Watt says, this by itself is not sufficient to give writers like Defoe and Richardson the reputation that they have. Defoe and Richardson certainly have other reasons, be have better reasons, certainly have better reasons, other reasons, better reasons to lay a claim on our attentions. But their historical significance arises out of the fact that they brought about with suddenness and completeness or rather they brought into being with suddenness and completeness formal realism, which is the sine qua non of the genre of the novel. We have indeed completed an exhilarating journey, though some of you may feel that it has been a rather long journey. One cannot but be impressed by Ian Watts' close familiarity with literature, especially the writings of the early novelists 
Defoe, Richardson, Fielding, and also his profound knowledge of Western philosophy, his ability to bring together aspects of philosophy and aspects of literature is impressive, as is his ability to bring philosophy and literature, to bring the great changes in philosophy and the great changes in literature under the canopy of the great transformations in Western civilization since the Renaissance. The essay, or rather the chapter, is brilliantly organized. The, content, the contentions are presented sequentially in a systematic manner. The logic is powerful and convincing. The arguments are buttressed repeatedly with appropriate concrete examples. There is never any attempt to impress only an attempt to inform and to convince. The logic, as I said, is powerful, but it is not chop logic. The arguments are never glib or specious or too subtle. The language, the prose style used by Ian Watt is perfectly suited to his purpose. The essay, or rather the chapter, is completely free from jargon. The sentences are carefully structured. The diction is simple, accessible and accessible to the common reader. There is no doubt that the work under discussion is one of the gems of 20th century literary criticism in English.